one. Saw the absolute end-all be-all last week. I work for a small production company and we do a ton of charitable work. That day a few of our crew members, myself included, were let out for a make-a-wish type thing for a girl whose wish was to have her original song made into a music video. She was battling cancer so, of course, every precaution had to be taken, COVID-wise. The director reserved a scenic section of the park and got all set up there so we could be outdoors with plenty of distance. Apparently this was the only section of the park with a picnic area. We weren't aware of this and occasionally some people would come over pretty miffed asking why we'd reserved the whole picnic area. But before they could get the whole complaint out they'd realize the situation and leave us be, embarrassed to even have asked. The young lady was around 14 or 15 and having a great time shooting these scenes for her music video until Q Karen, a mess of cheap Botox and overpriced athleisure gear, started crossing over our clearly marked barricades with her daughter around six or seven. Our PA, production assistant, rushed over, figuring she was just too dumb to notice all of our signage and physical blockades, and explained in a hushed tone that she was intruding on a private film set. Karen replied, intentionally loudly, that it was a public park and she had every right to use any part of it she pleased. Now, was it a tad bit inconvenient that we'd commandeered a large strip of public land? The only area with seating? Absolutely. But the handful of people who'd wander over to complain immediately processed the nature of this project and gladly made other plans for themselves. Karen wasn't budging, but we had a permit from the city to be there, so we let her know she could quiet down or shove off. We'd actually had a right to have her rejected if she was being disruptive to our filming. We didn't really want to though, and we didn't exactly have the manpower to do it without calling authorities. And we didn't want to put a damper on this fun event or make a scene in front of her daughter, so the director paused filming to try and de-escalate things. There was supposed to be a liaison from the Make-A-Wish style program there, but the catering guy had gotten lost on the way to the park, and she'd gone to look for him. So the director showed Karen the permit we had and warned her a final time she either needed to watch calmly or get out of there. She pulled her young daughter off to the side and started trying to goad her into singing. The kid was better able to read the room than mom because she was too embarrassed to start singing and tried saying she wanted to wait until she got home. But Karen kept pointing her phone camera at the kid and shrieking she wanted her to sing there and then so she could film it. Eventually she started playing some Disney song on her phone and the kid began hissing along, interrupting our footage much to Karen's twisted satisfaction. Finally, the director had had it and informed her that even though she had technically moved off the land we'd physically reserved, that the noise she and her daughter were generating was disruptive so he could still have her removed. Not even sure if this is true, but I think he just correctly assumed that. Hello, 911. This woman is harassing a young girl with cancer trying to experience her make-a-wish day. Wouldn't end in Karen's favor. But Karen's pride wouldn't allow her to simply walk away from the situation. So once her daughter had ceased this loud off-key singing, she continued lingering even as her child begged her to go and play at a pond almost a quarter of a mile over. Karen continually forced her daughter into the shot with hopes it would make us move, cruelly getting her kids' hopes up and then dashing them repeatedly. So I guess the kid wasn't especially bright either. She kept saying, Look, baby, they're making a movie. Quick, go be in the movie so you can get famous. Hurry! And the girl would run onto her set, or try to, and the PA or key grip would return her to her mom before she could run across our shot. But her daughter's anguished cries of disappointment at not becoming famous each time we returned her to her mom were enough to render most of the footage, if not useless, at least a lot less fun than it was intended to be. I guess Karen didn't think we'd hurt her goading her child into disrupting us with fake promises of superstardom. Because when the director came over for her final warning, she tried to play dumb saying, Oh, I think she's just that set on using the picnic space. Since this is the only picnic space in the entire park, it would probably just be easier for you to move, huh? Clearly she had no idea what it takes to set up for a film if she thought we could just move locations on a whim. The director turned out to be bluffing on calling the cops because he didn't want to create a scene until the liaison returned. So he just had a couple big crew guys keep her and her daughter at bay. Eventually, the liaison did come back. 
but honestly, she wasn't particularly helpful. Karen deduced that she was who was in charge and who everyone was waiting for in order to take action. So magically shaped up the minute she appeared and stood quietly to the side. So when every crew member descended on the liaison at once, she just meekly said, Well, it's fine if she watches, right? People are probably just curious what's going on. Thankfully, the girl in the video had been having her makeup done for most of this while we filmed the backup dancer scene, so didn't really notice most of the debacle and didn't care one way or another. Because Karen had her little kid with her, the girl didn't say she couldn't watch, even though she was visibly uncomfortable at the strange audience. She kept waving to and winking at the little girl, though, who thought she was some kind of celebrity. It was actually pretty cute and a perfect compliment to her music video Make-A-Wish. Karen hated that and kept muttering to passers-by trying to surmount insurrection, but unbeknownst to her, just about everyone in the general area was affiliated with our shoot. She did manage to find one or two people who were irritated about the picnic area being closed, thinking we were just some greedy private party who'd sectioned it off from other guests. But when they realized it was some kind of film production, they started milling around out of curiosity. Again, we were mostly filming backup dancers at this point, a couple of the girls' friends, so I give credit to Karen that if she wasn't paying a lot of close attention to the filming itself, it may not have been immediately obvious what exactly we were doing up at that point. That still doesn't make what she did next okay. She'd make the occasional comment to other picnic people and was winning some of them over. She'd say something like, I didn't eat the entire space and get an affirmative nod, whatever. I didn't think the other people were really listening that closely. They were watching too intently, waiting for someone famous to pop out in the music video. Our tech people had determined that it wasn't interfering with the audio, so we had begun to ignore her, as long as she stayed out of the way. Then the star girl comes out for her big emotional dance scene, and she's already giving it her all, so Karen decides to throw in another blow by turning to the woman nearest to her and saying again, loud enough for everyone to hear, Oh god, look, it's one of those girls who thinks it's cool to pretend to be a boy. I'll bet she hasn't stopped to consider how long it'll take to grow her hair back. You'd think Karen would have stopped for a second to consider that maybe the girl was not cultivating a chic new look and in fact had cancer. Or better yet, that maybe a stranger's hairstyle wasn't her business in any case. And maybe her not having eyebrows or arm hair either was a clue, but nope. So our poor starring girl hears this and crumples up into tears. Now assuming that the crowds who had been gathering throughout the day were not doing so because they thought she was some famous pop star, but instead to gawk because she was strange looking. She rushed away and though standing anywhere near Karen hurried off to make clear they weren't associated with her. That's when the liaison realized what we'd been trying to warn her about with Karen's behavior and tore into her along with several members of the girl's extended family. Like a true coward, Karen didn't even try to apologize. She just bolted as quickly as she could saying, You know, maybe we'll find a different spot since you're clearly busy. As though she was doing us a special consideration. Luckily our lead girl's entire extended family was there and cheered her up very quickly and some supportive civilians had shown up with genuine curiosity about the film set, then loved watching her dance for no other reason than that they loved watching her dance. So she was happy with having fun again very quickly after Karen skulked off. But still, really quite a hurtful and inappropriate spectacle. If she gets this worked up over a picnic table, I can only imagine when her daughter starts to face life's real challenges. 2. This happened a few years ago, in a parking lot of a mall I was going to with my mom, mid-July, nearly 39 degrees Celsius. When we get out of the car, I saw a movement at the corner of my eyes in the car behind us. I thought it was a dog at first, and I said to my mom, what asshole leaves a dog in a car when it's not hot? When I looked again, I saw that it was a baby, a one-year-old girl sitting at the back. I alarmed my mom, but she thought I was kidding, I was messing around and telling shitty jokes for the past 30 minute ride, and I was the kind to make dark humor jokes like that. When she didn't believe me, I bolted inside the mall, saw a security guard, and informed him with the number plate I'd memorized. He made a call through the speaker saying, If you're not in your car in two minutes, say goodbye to your passenger door. 
I lead him to the car, my mom following us, dumbfounded by this actually being true. And also infuriated, the security stopped her from smashing the window right there, and we waited, waving at the girl who seemed conscious through the tainted windows. A man arrived, yelling murder when he saw us. Stop, stop, that's my car, that's my daughter inside! Yes, you moron, that's your daughter inside, open the doors now! He unlocked the car at the security guard's request, took the baby outside. The car was an oven. She was soaking wet, covered with sweat, and started crying the moment she felt relatively fresh air outside. The guard guided us inside and gave us a cup of room temperature water to drink for the baby. When he got the cup of water in his hands, while the security guard explained to the cashier what was happening, the asshole had the audacity to drink from it first. My mom exploded, screaming at him to give it to his daughter. In such colorful language, I have no idea how to translate it. He really didn't seem to understand what was happening. He actually tried to go back to his half-full cart when the girl had finished her cup. The security guard stopped him just by putting a hand on his shoulder. Stay right there. My colleague will take your baby, okay? There, sit down. We're waiting for the police and the ambulance to arrive. Stay calm, breathe. Your daughter is okay. But we have to make sure of what happened, okay? Okay. After two minutes, the father said to the cashier who was holding his daughter and giving her water non-stop, Maybe give her another cup of water, it's hot. Dude, shut the fuck up, the police are on the way, said the security guard. Father complained again, and we just left. We were standing there, low-key hoping to see the security guard kick his ass, and we were totally useless for the most part. So I gave my info to the guard, and we went on our merry way. When we exited the mall after half an hour, the guy was gone, the daughter was gone, the car was still there, and the guard waved us goodbye with a big smile. We just assumed everything had gone well. I received a phone call two days later from the police, told and confirmed what happened, and learned that the asshole was facing a fine, years of prison, and had already lost custody of his child. And thinking of that day is how I managed to be proud of myself every once in a while. 3. We were having a day of hiking and picnicking in the park with my young girls. Six months, three years old. So, brought a bunch of toys. My wife went off to feed our baby, and I was playing with the three-year-old and her dolls, and she paired them all off into couples of men and women. Recently, we'd learned we really dropped the ball on teaching her about relationship diversity, because she went to visit her uncles, her married uncles, and threw a tantrum when we told her they were married because only boys and girls can get married. We thought she knew they were married because it's certainly no big secret, but definitely have gone out of our way to correct that assumption since. We basically just point out the LGBTQ plus people in her life and reinforce, you know these people, you like them, they like you. It's no different than knowing a straight couple. She's been super receptive to it, and I think she just hadn't seen any gay people on TV or in books and was oblivious to the one she saw in everyday life, so wasn't sure what to think. So I said, let's put these two girls together like your friend Hannah's mommies, and these two boys together like Uncle X and Uncle Y. The rest can stay as they were. This way more people are included, isn't that nice? And she said, yeah, and we played and it was fine. Enter the entitled mother and her somehow normal kid, about 10 years old, and my kid. Excuse me, what are you doing? My kid says, playing dollies. Sir, excuse me, hello, I don't appreciate you talking about sex in front of my kids. When was I talking about sex? The G word and the L word. I didn't say either of those, and I can talk to my kid about anything I want, so unless there's anything else. I won't have you sharing adults' conversations with a toddler here in public or anywhere. Really, that's too bad. Because once we finished talking about inclusion, I was going to crack open a 40 ounce and read some Hustler for story time. Is she even your daughter? Is that even your son? At this point, a woman walks by with a baby, and EM tries to pull her into the conversation. This man is going up to children in the park and trying to teach them about SEX. This woman, who we'll call wife because she's mine, was having none of that. What was he saying? 
he was telling this toddler about G-A-Y-S-E-X. Thankfully, she knew the woman must be nuts. I thought we said no gay sex until her fourth birthday. She rushed to cover her kid's ears. This is everything wrong with our kids today. You're forcing them to grow up before their time. You want your daughter to have those messages in her head? You're going to traumatize her. My dollies are at the grocery store and they're going to buy popsicles. I ate a popsicle today. It was a yellow one, says my daughter. Uh-oh. You think popsicles is a euphemism or something? The EM takes her kid and storms off. Fifteen minutes pass and everyone's getting hungry, so we break out some snacks. I'm helping my kid get the green tops off of her strawberries. A park ranger comes over. Excuse me, a woman reported there was some sort of inappropriate sexual activity going on at this site. What, really? Oh no. Well, I've got my kids with me. Do you think we should move? The park ranger looks around confused. No, no, just keep an eye open for anything strange, and if you see something, drop by the ranger station and let us know. About an hour later, just as we're thinking it's time to head home, she comes back through. How are you still here? We ignore her at this point. You know there are piles of studies in child psychology that say what you're doing is what's ruining America. I wanted so badly to say something snarky but kept my mouth shut. But then EM directed her insanity at my kids. And you better believe that didn't sit well with my wife. Honey, does it make you sad when daddy tries to tell you things you don't understand? Don't you talk to my kid one more time. Don't look in our direction. Don't breathe on me. Get out of here. Right now. Leave. Of course, my three-year-old doesn't know why she's upset, so starts crying. This yelling and crying attracted the attention of a different park ranger. Problem, folks. EM started screaming almost incoherently while her poor embarrassed kid was like, Mom, Mom, let's just go. Let's go. Come on. I'm so glad you're here, says my wife. We were just getting ready to leave when this woman who has been harassing us all day came up and started talking to my daughter. The park ranger took her aside and took us aside and we gave our sides of the story. EM was nearly in tears and we could hear her throwing out words like decency and innocence. When he came up to us we briefly explained but said we were already on our way so didn't want to take this any further. He said we should just go. We packed up and left. Ian couldn't believe we were let go, and was still berating the park ranger with her embarrassed son when we left. Everyone should just mind their own damn business. The end. 4. So this happened roughly about two years ago. I was reminded of it when I logged into my Hinge account and saw that entitled son had messaged me. No, I haven't responded, nor intend to. So we dated for about four months two years ago. It wasn't the most amazing relationship in the world, but I was happy in it for a time. We dated for a few weeks, and things seemed to be going pretty well. Then I was introduced to his Karen mother. At first she was kind and welcoming to me, always offered me cigarettes and to drop me off to work every now and again, but it wasn't long before the cracks started to show. She treated Entitled Son like a slave, and they were pretty close. Not a healthy close, more like a codependent relationship. She needed him to do everything for her, lift up a box, stir her tea, do the shopping, you name it. She was incapable of doing anything for herself. All she did was smoke and watch TV. Lord knows how she would cope if he were to see through her. He lived with her, and he was 36 or 37 at the time. When I came into the picture, I'm pretty sure she was threatened by my presence. I could potentially take her baby away from her, talk some sense into him or something. But that would mean that Entitled Son had a shiny spine to speak of, which he did not. He wrapped around his mother's finger, despite protest to the contrary. First of all, she had these insane delusions of grandeur. She would tell me she was a solicitor, however, when I asked her what her speciality was, it would change every time. First it was employment, then it was medical malpractice. You name it, she knew everything about the subject. When I gave her quizzical looks on the subject, she tried convincing me that she was a nurse, which again changed like the wind. First she was a midwife, then an RMN, which she would say when I talked about work, I work in rehab, and say she knew everything about the work I do, then surprised when I was able to prove the contrary. 
She had these insane views that she knew everything in the world, and if you were to tell her any different, then you were just arguing for the sake of it. I still did, and she hated me for it. She also tried to convince me that she owned her home. Considering that she lived in a major city in one of the most expensive areas in the city, when she didn't work and hadn't for at least 20 years, turns out it was government housing that she never paid for, and had been in government housing for years and years. In fact, she would put on a very posh accent, tell people she was a lot better off financially than she actually was. She was living off entitled son's wages and government help. She'd scream that she needed the help for her back or mysterious pain she had. Yet, there was no medical reports to back her claims up. She would scream and shout until she got her way. There were a load of incidents that made me run a mile from them. But here are a few that stick out. One day, midway through work, my phone busted. Now I need my phone for work, so I packed and titled Mom and Son for help. This was right after work, and I was due in that night. So she offered. The entire time, she was driving around, crying. It's so early, I need a coffee. But I need a coffee. Oh god, I'm so tired. Saying this to me, the woman who had just finished a 13-hour shift. She was driving around for three hours, all the while saying she needed a coffee, me close to tears, because I was so tired and she was refusing to get out of the car to get said coffee. It was for her son to get. Eventually, I got my phone in to be fixed, which was a solid three hours longer than it should be because she was screaming for her coffee. Afterwards, when I was in the car with her, nearly crying, she had the guts to ask me what was wrong, and I told her. She did not like that. The most embarrassing? Me and Entitled Son were getting intimate, and midway through the deed, his mother was on the phone to the other son. They were having a blowout argument, and it ended with her slamming the phone down. She knew I was there, and it only took a bit of common sense to know what we were doing. But she stormed upstairs and the door flew open. She needed to rant, after all. She saw the two of us there together and instantly went red and shut the door. But then a few seconds later said, No, I need to rant about this! And proceeded to rant and rave for ten bloody minutes. All the while I'm scrambling to cover myself up, I was mortified. One day I was due to go to his place after a night shift. He woke me up at 4pm and I told him to wait an hour or two for me to wake up. He called me 20 minutes later because he wanted to see me, and his mother didn't want to wait around for an hour. I was annoyed, and we started arguing over the phone. His mother was trying to get involved in the argument, and I had had enough at this point and told the both of them. There are three people in this relationship, and I am the least important. Oh, they did not like that in the slightest. That was when she decided that the relationship was not worth it and told him to break it off with me. She told him to break it off. And this man actually entertained the idea. He didn't listen to her, but it was the beginning of the end of the relationship. She would tell him over and over that I was a bad, horrid whore of a woman. She's a terrible influence. And that bitch is not welcome in my home. By this time, I just stopped caring. We ended up breaking up maybe a month after this. He did it over text when I refused to apologize to her. He was on my side initially but then asked me to apologize for the sake of keeping the peace, which I would not do. I won't reward bad behavior. I had zero Fs to give at this point. I was happy for him to take himself out of my life. I ended up blocking all contact. And now this message over Hinge. I have zero interest in messaging him back. One more thing to note. My parents passed a few years ago. It was hard, but I managed to find some kind of equilibrium. It's still hard some days, but after many years of substance and alcohol abuse, I managed to get through the grief as best as I could. I told both him and his mother about this, and it is hard for me some days. During an argument one day, we argued a fair bit, one of the main reasons why we split. You would never understand what it's like to have a close relationship with your family. They're all dead. I didn't bother screaming in his face because I knew he was seeking a reaction. I simply hung up the phone and didn't talk to him for a few days. The depths that man would go to to be hurtful was insane. And I'm happy to have not stayed in such a toxic environment. Lord knows if I did, not only would I be bullied into having children, they aren't high up in my list, and this Karen would be a JNMIL. 5. I'm a youth sports coach, and whatever stories you've heard about insane parents, it can be even worse than that. 
I'm in a league where parents are already planning out their kids' target colleges before they can walk. But most of the kids are completely average. Because that's what average means. And because other schools have the luxury of players who want to participate. I have kids who were pressured into the game by mom and dad, so don't bring the same heart to the field. It makes it quite difficult to read them. For example, I only just got free of a dispute that's been going on for over three months. A sweet but clumsy sophomore who has fun with his teammates but is overall completely indifferent to the sport was out indefinitely with a serious rotator cuff injury. He'd had surgery, but he was still in on practices at his parents' insistence. But by no means was he taking a step in the direction of the field. He never complained or protested. Like my diehard kids who want to be here do, often to their own detriment, he was just as happy to be sitting playing video games. Great. The best player you can hope for is one who doesn't rush recovery. I was proud of and relieved by how he was handling things. So one day, not even three weeks after his surgery, his mom shows up and says, All right, my son's cleared to play. He can start back today. Maybe someone should take some time to work with him, one-on-one -on -one to get him caught up. Hmm? I was surprised, but I'm not a doctor, so if they cleared him, he's clear. But as is protocol, I asked for an official letter from the medical office approving him to return to practice for the team's files. His mom was flabbergasted. I don't have it with me. Who carries that around? It hadn't even occurred to me she might be doing something so brazen and reckless as what she was. So without skipping a beat, I cheerfully said, No worries. He can hang with us while you run home and fax or email it to me. She stuttered for a second and finally came up with, I don't have time to go all the way home. I have another appointment. It was then that I noticed her son was looking kind of uncomfortable throughout all this. And while he isn't our most enthusiastic guy, I would have still expected him to be psyched to return to practice after sitting patiently on the sidelines for such a long hiatus. So while I might have agreed to wait to the next day to see the latter in any other case, Knowing the player would start back by easing in very slowly regardless, I knew this time I had to see written proof before so much as giving the kid a light stretch routine. I told mom, so I'll just give his doctor's office a call and they can send the letter to us. It's still early, we can catch them if we call right now. And stood there, expectantly, waiting for her to call. She gasped and stuttered some more before finally blurting out, He isn't being treated by a big western pharma doctor. He's on an essential oil regimen. I didn't know whether to laugh or start shouting. It was so ridiculous that she was even positing treating an internal injury with essential oils. But even more so, infuriating that she would risk her son's health just to get him back in practice a few weeks early. I couldn't tell straight away if she genuinely thought the oils had healed his shoulder, which still visibly appeared to be causing him pain, or if she was just saying that to try to get out of producing the letter she didn't have, because he was seeing a doctor who had not cleared him yet. I was stuck at that point and called another coach over to confer privately. After giving her a rundown of the situation, she suggested a foolproof plan. I returned to the boy's mother and said, So I just talked with some other members of the staff and I have great news. The team physician can do a routine post-op exam right now and write a letter. Thankfully, she didn't call my bluff because while we do have a team physician, you have to make appointments with him a week or more in advance. So his mother says she isn't comfortable with him seeing a strange doctor. I reiterate, this is our team physician, who has assisted her son whenever he's been injured on the field, not a stranger to him. She pivoted back to not trusting Western medicine and wanting to maintain the essential oils plan. She started going off about how all these scans are not going to give him radiation poisoning, etc. So I told her I couldn't help her and sent her on her way. Her son was mouthing, Sorry, coach, to me as she gave her speech, and I knew then that I had done the right thing. You could see in his eyes he did not have anything to do with this scheme to rush back on the field. She stormed off, absolutely irate, cursing me and even some players from her own son's team who passed her on the way out and continued making a scene out front until someone from marching band practice asked her to leave because they literally could not hear all of the instruments with the way she was carrying on. Not even 24 hours later, the principal and head of athletics each had letters from a law firm accusing us of discriminating against her son, 
preventing him from playing because of the family's belief in alternative medicine. To be abundantly clear, a shoulder injury is very serious, especially at her son's age. If he didn't do the proper steps for recovery, he could be stuck with a lifetime of pain, and not just never play sports again, but never lift anything, or hold basic positions without mind-bending pain. Not to mention the potentially permanent mobility problems were he to re-injure himself by playing contact sports while hurt. So in short, this was a matter of way more than jostling for authority with a parent or personal views about healthcare. It was an issue of my player's physical safety and a hill I was more than willing to die on. I was prepared to go out of my own pocket for a lawyer and say all of that in court if need be, I was in no position to do so financially, but I didn't care. Like I said, I would die on this hill. The principal showed me the letter to his lawyer wife, who suggested we just ignore it, and see if the kid's mom would just tire of investing time and money into the situation. I know what you're thinking, and you're exactly right. She was not going down that easy. She was back with the lawyer in person at a practice the following week. He tried to tell me something about how, as a team at public school, I could not prevent her son from participating because of the family's personal beliefs, and every child had the right to do public school activities. Well, I couldn't be further from a lawyer, but that was still easy even for me. Guy, this is a tryout team. No one is guaranteed participation, and I can cut players for any reason I see fit. That stymied him, and I think he told the boy's mother that she was out of options. But I guess she kept sending him checks because he kept writing us letters. Out of an abundance of caution, since you never know how far a crazy person is willing to take a thing like this, or how much money she had to pursue the issue, I had to consult with an attorney of my own. I gave her all of the documents to review, and once she was finished laughing uncontrollably, she told me not to think twice about this, and to only come back if I was served with actual papers to appear in court. Six weeks later, I was back in her office. The boy's mother was bringing the school into a civil suit, and I had been called to testify. I met with the lawyer, and I'm lucky she was so honest, she told me the district would probably have counsel for me, and to wait before cutting her any checks. She was right. So I was in a big harried meeting preparing for this case, all of the team boosters were there, top administrators I had only ever heard the name of, but never seen in person, and even more people still who I've already forgotten because these meetings were such a stressful blur. It was getting very serious very quickly. More than once, I was pulled aside by someone with more important places to be and asked if I couldn't just clear the kid to play. By the time things began to wrap up, I was making good and frequent use of that Randy Jackson meme. Yeah, that's gonna be a no from me, dog. We were about a week and a half out from the first official court date and in serious discussions with the school's counsel about actually just buying these people off of the team and settling out of court if they agreed to walk away from the sport and drop the issue. No one wanted to hear me explain all the reasons why that would never work. I was just leaving a smaller one of these strategy meetings when I saw the kid loitering outside of my office. I knew I wasn't supposed to speak to any of them, but the kid had been really cool throughout the whole ordeal, and he definitely wished he wasn't associated with any of his mom's wild antics. So I cautiously approached, and before I could even say anything, the kid drags his dad out from around the corner. His dad seemed concerned his wife might drop out of a ceiling grate or something, but his son was determined and prodded him along. Do it. Let's go. His dad, keeping his head on a constant swivel, quietly said, I understand you could have my son cleared by a team physician. I nodded, and the dad hesitated, but the son was clearly fed up and staring daggers at the man. Okay then, let's get fucking going. Sign what you need to sign for me to see who I need to see. My guess is he didn't want to be known as the player who had testified against his team, because parents are chatty and everyone at school definitely knew about what was going on. The poor hand-packed guy kept saying quietly enough that his son couldn't hear, Listen, if my wife ever find out about this, holy hell, can you please just not make a big scene with it? Just say it was clear to play, no need to advertise how it happened, okay? I assured him, not only would I never advertise a student's private business for social clout, but that when it came to medical issues, I was legally prohibited from sharing information with anyone. So I sent one of the only messages flagged urgent that I have ever had to direct to our team doctor. 
and by the end of the day our highly reviled strategy team was able to place a call informing the mother that her son was cleared to return to practice. Now, don't get it twisted. I didn't ram his recovery paperwork through a back channel to end the suit or alleviate pressure from the administration. His mom had dragged this whole ordeal out so long that he'd actually fully healed. Our doctor was able to pass him with flying colors. She still isn't the worst parent I've had to deal with hostility-wise, but certainly the most serious matter. Other people will get into it with us over playing time or game schedules or even their kid's uniform number. This is the only one I can remember being this negligent with her son's physical well-being, so it will always rank highest as my worst parent experience. It was just finally confirmed that I am 100% free of all the legal brouhaha, so I can gleefully share the story, with strangers at least. Don't want to put the kid on blast in our tiny community, but do want to vent to a whole bunch of people. So everyone play safe out there, and thanks if you've listened this far. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to The Impractical Proudness of Parents. Hi, Pop. Episode 57. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. If you enjoyed the video, then please do give it a like for me, possibly leave a comment, and if you'd like to see more, then you can click the subscribe button. I'm currently in the sleep half a night, uh, wake up, do work, then sleep the rest stage of um, fixing my sleep schedule. Probably not the bright way. To, usually I'd just kind of stay awake and then pass out and then yeah, that'd be me, it'd be good, but yeah. Work has to be done, so we do work. Then I'll nap when I'm done. Then dinner, then I'm... Mm, I'm going to say no streams for the rest of the week. Uh, maybe not until till Saturday. Let's see if we can keep that up, because it's like an addiction with me, these streams lately. But I'll do that just to kind of focus on sort of resting and resetting the old brain and body. Okay, with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.